to hear. Uh, but it is a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to you the man who needs no introduction, the President of the United States. Thank you. Please sit down. Well, thank all of you. It's wonderful to have you here in the executive office building. Actually, this is the old EOB. There's a new one across the street. This is called the OEOB. It's quite a mouthful. But you know, the folks who work here have solved that problem. They call this the White House. So, I know you've already been briefed by Ron Perlman and Don Regan, Pat Buchanan, Beryl Sprinkle. And since I know them all well, I know they had some very specific and convincing arguments on why our fair share tax proposal should be adopted. And I know they told you how much we need your help. But I just want to mention here the philosophical underpinnings, if I could for a minute or two, of tax reform the philosophy that guided us as we were putting the plan together. We didn't worry too much about the special interest groups and the special interest pleading. We didn't uh, worry about pressure groups and such. We were concerned about the interests of all working Americans, starting with one central entity, an entity that is itself central to the interests of the entire nation, the family. And so we created a tax reform proposal that puts the family first. Because there's nothing more important to all of us and nothing more important to our society, our nation, and our future than the family. That's where our children learn a moral view. It's where the values of personal responsibility and loyalty and kindness are taught. It's not exaggerating to say it as the, as the family goes, so goes the nation. Now, there are many people who share this view. It isn't exactly revolutionary. But in spite of our agreement in this country that the family counts, in spite of that, too many policies of our nation have for decades worked against the interest of the family. You know the facts, and I'm sure you've heard them repeated today. One of the clearest evidences of how careless we've been in our support of the family is the personal tax exemption for each child and dependent. In 1948, that exemption was $600. And if we'd kept up with inflation, the exemption today would be $2,700. Well, as you know, it hasn't nearly kept up. Administration after administration failed to increase the, the exemption. They devoted more time to finding new ways to spend the family's earnings. And I'm tired of that kind of behavior, and I think most of the people are. Tired of those who put the family at the end of the line. In 1981, we indexed the personal exemption to inflation so that it's now $1,040. And in our tax reform proposal, we've raised that exemption to $2,000. That's a big step in the right direction. It doesn't completely index it to match what inflation has done. But you know about the other parts of the plan that benefit the family, reducing tax rates, extending the full IRA benefits to those who work in the home and the earned income tax credit. We're proud of all this, and that's why I consider this a family-first bill, and I intend to watch over the provisions of that bill just like I used to watch over my own children. As I'm sure many of you know recently, the House Select Committee on Children, Youth, and Families reported that our tax reform plan was the most pro-family of all the major tax proposals before the Congress. The committee said it's fair to low-income working families, it's fair to large families, single-parent families, and average-income families. Now, that assessment of our reforms didn't just come from some Republicans on that committee, because in that House committee, the Republicans are in the minority. It came from the Democrat majority as well. So I hope you'll conclude that our tax proposal deserves your support. We'd like your support, and I'm not embarrassed to ask for it. If you have any nagging questions or doubts, please talk to the members of the staff here and 
they'll do whatever they can. But again, I thank you for coming here today and taking part in this debate on this issue. That's what democracy is, and it's good. And now I know I've got a few minutes left, and maybe there's some questions you... Yes. Mr. President, I came today in the capacity editor of the Reagan Report. And I wonder, do you remember when you made the 25% cut that yeah. people said that did not benefit the truly needed? However, this initiative, this proposal, benefit those people. They will be stay out of the road yes. and all the middle class. Do you feel when the people know this fact, we put some pressure and hit in the country in order to enact this legislation by October the 15th. How do you respond? Well, I think that this is where you can all be of such help, that when the facts are understood, the people that are at or below the poverty line are virtually free of all tax. We say there are three brackets, 15, 25, and 35, instead of the present 14 brackets. But there is a fourth bracket. It's zero. And it's going to apply to a lot of people who today are being taxed. This. Yeah. My, my name is Karen Lowe. I'm oh. from San Juan. Sorry, I'll get you next. Yes. Um, the, some of the Caribbean leaders have complained that the Caribbean Basin Initiative has not lived up to its promise. Uh, the leader of Puerto Rico, Governor of Puerto Rico, came here last week to present a proposal that he felt would um, uh, create new investment in the Caribbean by tying. Uh, tax-exempt funds that corporations now receive to new investment, um, the twin plant concept, he calls it. Can you tell me how you respond to the governor's... Now, if I understand correctly, because I, I missed and didn't hear the first part of what you were saying, this is with regard to the pension plans... Yeah, the Caribbean Basin Initiative. Caribbean oh. leaders have said that it has not lived up to its promise. Uh, the, the governor of Puerto Rico has proposed a plan that would stimulate new investment in the area. What I want to know is how you respond to the governor's um, plan uh, to put Puerto Rico in a leadership role to um, tie funds that corporations now are getting uh, tax well, I, I haven't seen that proposal or had it brought to my attention as yet. I'd like to see it and uh, if, if the plan that we put in, the Caribbean plan, uh, isn't doing all that we had hoped that it would do, I'd like to also then see where, uh, where that has failed or where it has failed to um, meet the hopes that we had for it. But I couldn't answer until I see uh, what it is that he's proposing. And as I say, uh, see where also the present plan is not working. Now. Mr. President, my name is Martin Byrne. I'm from the Iron Workers International Union. One of the largest obstacles that I can see with the, with the reform tax bill passed in the Congress is the taxing of medical benefits uh, for workers. Uh, just thinking out loud to myself, wouldn't it be wise rather than uh, inhibit the possibility of the package passing, wouldn't it be wise to eliminate uh, uh, the taxing of fringe benefits? Well, actually what we've done is cap, uh, put a cap at above a certain amount uh, is is taxable. On the other hand, if we're going to have this simplified tax plan and lower the rates, there are some things in the area, many things in the area of present deductions that we're going to have to eliminate. And the, all we have to look at is putting them in context. And if by taxing some fringe benefits, which were not taxed before simply because Again, this was part of that whole attempt at trying to get around the excessively high tax rates, was to get some income, uh, not in cash, but in uh, those fringe benefits. But if we can show, and we can, that the rates that we're proposing will leave the individual paying a lower tax even without some of those present tax-free benefits, and if we start if we start saying here and there uh, that we can't do that, uh, pretty soon we're back to the same kind of tax system we have now and we can't reduce the rates. Pardon? Yes? Uh, sir, Ricardo Alonso Saldivar with the Miami Herald. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question on a, on a different subject, sir, if I may. The immigration bill, 
uh, Chairman Rodino in the House has said that to get action on this this year, uh, Congress needs um, a demonstration of your personal commitment to immigration reform, sir, and your political leadership to get this measure through Congress. Uh, are you prepared uh, to take any steps in this regard, and if so, what steps, sir? We supported the previous bill. I'm sure that we'll be supporting this one. And if there hasn't been any sign of us uh, moving on that as yet, we still believe that our immigration uh, needs uh, reform. If there hasn't been any sign, it's because uh, there's so much on the plate and uh, these immediate things, uh, such as trying to get the tax reform passed before the end of this year, and remember the uh, our fiscal year actually ends in uh, uh, in another month, the or uh, the end of this month. But uh, that the deficit problem, all of these things, uh, we've just been pushing on those. It was only a few weeks ago that I heard uh, or read in a number of publications that. I was so uh, talking about tax reform so much that I wasn't paying any attention to the deficit or balancing the budget or anything of that kind. We are paying attention to it. But yes, we intend to support. We must have uh, reform of our immigration laws. We've lost control of our own borders, and we have to do something about it. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Charles Green with Night Ritter Newspapers. How do you account for the criticism that your executive order on South Africa has received from some of the people that it's supposed to help, namely Bishop Tutu in South Africa responded by calling you a racist, and the reaction from American black leaders has been almost uniformly negative. I have to say that um, this is one of those times in which I think I'm standing against a cellophane wall and being shot at on both sides. And there must be something right about our executive order to have uh, found that uh, both sides are finding things or saying if, if they should have a debate because uh, they can't both be right. The, I know that there, and I was surprised at the intemperate remarks of Bishop Tutu. I have met him. Uh, I'm sure he's sincere in what he's trying to achieve. But I have to point one thing out. Of all of the people that are talking, our constructive engagement program over these past few years has achieved more improvement than anyone else has achieved in the South African situation. Not nearly enough, but such things as the strides that were made with regard to uh, desegregation in public places, uh, labor rights and union rights and so forth with regard to the uh, black employees, the uh, uh, black ownership of businesses that were permitted to establish themselves in some 40 districts heretofore restricted to the, the white only. As I say, not nearly enough, but at least there were steps going in that way, and we're going to continue. And the reason for my executive order was because with the violence, the crisis situation that is there, we felt that we needed to do a little more than we've been doing with regard to pressing and having influence on the uh, South African government. They're a sovereign state. We can't just move in and order them to do something n any more than we would allow someone to order us to do something. We can influence them, and we've proved it in the past. And I believe that uh, these things that we've uh, put in that order, I think that uh, we should give a little while for, uh, uh, to see how they're going to work out Remember that in South Africa, you have a tribal situation with 10 divisions among the black tribes. A lot of the problem that has been shown in the violence so far has been conflict between those groups, not just between the two races. You also have a division in the white community. You have a large segment of the population that has been working and and against odds and has been trying to get improvement and once the system changed, you have another hard-nosed faction that doesn't want any change whatsoever. Now, with all of this in mind, uh, I'd like to point out that some of the things that were being proposed, for example, those uh, on the more liberal side, 
who criticize me because they think we should do something much more forceful than has been done. Uh, those people uh, are taking no position with regard or against the violence that's going on, and they at the same time are not taking the position that some of the other responsible leaders, Butelezi, who is the leader of the largest tribal group in South Africa, who has pointed out that economically, uh, American investment and so forth has been responsible for the the black community there having the highest standard of living in almost all of the um, black states where it isn't uh, a racial problem but where it is a tribal problem. And uh, so I'm just, uh, I can't take seriously the criticisms. I haven't seen anyone pick out something and say, well, you shouldn't have done this or should have done something else. We're trying to influence that government and be of help in finding a nonviolent solution. We only have time for one more question. Oh dear. <laughs> Ed Barman, the editor of the Catholic University of Bolton, Cleveland. Uh, this is on a different subject, but it's economics. And that is our most pressing problem today is postage rates. And the Postal uh, Board of Governors uh, says that it plans to increase our postage rates around 31% October the 1st. This is going to be a, a crucial item for many people here from the nonprofit press. And I wonder if you could use your influence with Congress to give us some relief. I, uh, my influence with Congress. <laughs> I'll have to tell Tip about that. <laughs> well, I think once again, uh, we're seeing another example. I know that I've been hung out to dry a number of times because of my supposed ideology with regard to government doing things that maybe government was not the proper agent for doing them. And I think the Postal Service is an example of that. I remember some years ago, the figures wouldn't be appropriate now, but they were then, that I was pointing out an example of government and uh, its invasion of the private sector and so forth, and I pointed out that at that time, or there was a time about then, 25 years ago, before, when you could make a telephone call from San Francisco to New York and it cost about $25.70, as I remember. And for that amount of money, at that time with the postage rate, you could send 1,300 letters from San Francisco to New York. And at the time I was stating these figures from a speaking platform, I then said, at that present time, you could now make that telephone call for some 50 odd cents from San Francisco to New York, and for that amount of money, you could only send three letters. And at the time, I said, and so the government is trying to do something to the bell system. Um, the <laughs> I think the situation still prevails. Maybe the answer would be, uh, with the Postal, postal Service, is to uh, do anything we can to free up the private delivery of mail in competition with the government and see which one could come out on top. I think there's already evidence that there are some that can do better. There was a cartoon the other day that illustrated that. It showed an executive in our postal department who had a rush letter and was saying to his secretary, this has to get there by tomorrow, send it Federal Express. <laughs> but, well, they tell me that I've used up all my time. I'm sorry, there are more hands than... I'm, you, I can't... Uh, I can't do it, but I know that there are others here that perhaps can. Well, you get your tax bill. Well, Congress passed the tax bill. I think I am optimistic about it for the simple reason that uh, it is by the approach is bipartisan. Uh, we haven't found anything of, of a party lineup on this, and uh, Danny Rostenkowski is uh, he is swearing that he can he can get this bill uh, out of the Ways and Means Committee in the House. Uh, I guess before the end of this month, or no, next month, next month in October, 
And uh, so I have to believe that this is one in which maybe we won't be Democrats and Republicans, we'll just be Americans that want a tax cut. Right. Better escape fast. Okay. Thank you very much. He says I can. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please be careful. Not